Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 732 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 13th of January 2024 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Barbara Nicholas about all kinds of craft and mindset things, overcoming fears, how she finally listened to the voice inside that said she should be a writer, why our writing is important even when sometimes we feel it might be a bit pointless, healing through writing, writing unique characters, and much more. Now, I loved connecting with Barbara because I'm a fan of her work, particularly the Dr. Evan Wilding books, which we talk about. And we connected because I recommended one of her books in my fiction email list for JF Penn. And it turns out she was on my list and reached out to thank me. And that's how we connected. She shares some hard-won experience in this interview. And one particular quote stands out. She said, We can't control how the world reacts to what we produce, but the act of producing itself is a balm to the soul. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing things, Orna Ross and I did a podcast episode on planning for a creative 2024 and trends for independent authors. That is on the self-publishing advice podcast. And unsurprisingly, well, first of all, we talked about how we both plan in different ways for across the year. And Orna and I, it's so funny because generally I am far more organized than Orna. But when it comes to planning, she is far more organized than me. (laughs) So we talk about how we both plan in different ways. Then we talk about the two big trends that we see for the year, which of course, you won't be surprised, are direct sales, beautiful books and other products, not just digital. So wider than wide approach and also generative AI. And we talk about that um, and what that means. So that's on the self-publishing advice uh, podcast, or you can go to selfpublishingadvice.org and it's linked there. We were also both on the Draft a Digital podcast, which is called Self-Publishing Insiders, along with Mark Coker, Jane Friedman and Dale L. Roberts, reflecting on 2023 and looking forward into 2024. So there is a video if you'd like to see us, the rare videos of us discussing things as we were live. And it's also going out on the podcast feed. So once again, the discussion was focused on why authors are going wide and direct and what, what is the sort of unhappiness with the big retailer first uh, approach and also AI as a common theme again but with different viewpoints with Mark and Jane and Dale as well so that was interesting. So for years I separated out the AI and futurist section into something else but now it seems that is converging with real-time publishing and book marketing news. Uh, So this week a few things happened so the GPT store launched on ChatGPT if you're a plus subscriber you can find all kinds of custom GPTs that will help you do things. You could think of it like an app for a specific task So my Jobot is there, uh, thecreativepen.com forward slash Jobot, J-O-B-O-T, which is fine tuned with my books. So you can ask it to help you with writing, publishing, marketing, mindset, author business, whatever you want in that area. And uh, so, yeah, you can find that links in the show notes as ever. But The Verge reported on that. And of course, you can just go to that on ChatGPT. But there are already many, many thousands of interesting and useful ways to use stuff. So if you want to, if you've been like, oh, I don't really know how to use it. Well, this will show you lots of ways to use it. I've been playing with one this morning called Innovator, which combines sort of various random ideas and and prompts and things in the background to generate lists of ideas for you. So I asked it, I started by asking it, um, how can an independent author make a sustainable living in an age of generative AI, which of course is a pretty big question. (laughs) So uh, it generated some really fascinating ideas, which I'm exploring in more detail with chat. And uh, so things like that, I think are, are very interesting. So that that particular one is called Innovator. Um, and yeah, lots more available. 
CES was also on this week, the Consumer Electronics Show, but it's much more than that. It's a sort of glimpse into what is coming, what is popular, what is taking off. Um, I watched the keynote about the rabbit. Now, (laughs) this is an AI-powered handheld device, which almost hopes to reinvent the mobile or app experience with a, like a really smart, Alexa, I guess, but it also has agentic capability. And when we say agentic, when it comes to AI, it means it can actually go and do stuff for you. So you can just talk to it and it can call you an Uber or it can book things. And uh, I presume it can tell you a story. I presume it can do all sorts of things. And it's pocket sized, but it's not a phone. Now, even if you're not interested in the device, I found the keynote by the founder very, very good for how the mobile and app experience might be disrupted. Again, you have to remember that and at my 50, my own 15 year journey is really interesting because it coincides almost exactly with 15 years of the iPhone and the Kindle, both of which were launched in 2007. So while our industry is also being disrupted, the tech is also going to be disrupted. Now, of course, Apple, <laughs> Apple have put their uh, headset, is, is the headset's coming out in February, but the thinking is that they will move towards some really, really nice pair of glasses. Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm, I might be an early thinker, but I'm not necessarily an early adopter of hardware. So it took me a couple of years to get to the Apple Watch, which I love now. It took me a couple of years to get to a smartphone, (laughs) to be honest. Uh, The headset, I really want one. I think it's going to be very, very interesting how we adapt our content to a new heads-up display, which is more immersive. And I see us doing immersive experiences for readers, for teaching. Uh, Instead of watching a YouTube video of me, you would put on your glasses or a headset and I will be right there with you. Or I could be doing this. I could presumably record this and me talking about this stuff and put that into something which becomes much more immersive of an experience. So that's another thing to think about. My 15-year disruption is, okay, what is the 15-year disruption of the iPhone or the smartphone and uh, the Kindle? And that's why this rabbit keynote was interesting to me. I'm not buying a rabbit, but I think how he framed a disruptive time was very interesting. Uh, That's at rabbit.tech forward slash keynote, links in the show notes. Also, The Verge reported, this is this is classic, The Verge reported, Getty has launched their own generative AI into iStock Photo. And <laughs> this made me laugh. I actually mentioned this uh, about six months ago when Getty sued, who did they sue? I think they sued Stability or they sued somebody. It might have been Midjourney, but they've sued some generative AI images and said, you know, you can't do this. Uh, but now they've launched their own. But the interesting thing is, and for for you listening, if you've been really worried about using Midjourney or ChatGPT Dali for images, then Getty launching their own generative AI within iStock Photo means that you can generate your images within their platform and you know that the copyright is fine you're licensing the image as you would any other stock photo now what this also means uh, this is huge because I just can't see that you can be anti-AI for book cover design when pretty much the biggest service now has generative AI this it would be for book cover designers, they they now know this is fine. They can download this and there's no worry because they've been downloading off iStock Photo for years. So yeah, I think almost every stock photo site now has some form of this. And the most prestigious one, which is Getty, the most expensive one uh, in terms of the their mainstream store, they're using their own corpus of images and they've trained their model. So yeah, have a look at that. Um, that is, I think it's called Getty with iStock or something like that. Links in the show notes. Also, Microsoft announced an AI key on their new keyboards, which is the biggest change to its keyboard in three decades, according to the BBC. This key will allow users to access Copilot, Microsoft's AI, on new PCs. And of course, Copilot is powered by OpenAI's GPT-4. And talking of OpenAI, they addressed the New York Times lawsuit in a blog post this week. The opening paragraph reads... Our goal is to develop AI tools that empower people to solve problems that are otherwise out of reach. 
People worldwide are already using our technology to improve their daily lives. And there's lots of hyperlinks to proof of all this. Millions of developers and more than 92% of Fortune 500 companies are building on our products today. That was the interesting stat to me. 92% of Fortune 500 companies building on it. While we disagree with the claims in the New York Times lawsuit, we view it as an opportunity to clarify our business, our intent and how we build our technology. Our position can be summed up in these four points. We collaborate with news organisations and are creating new opportunities. And they have a lot of licensing deals already and they're making more. Training is fair use, but we provide an opt-out because it's the right thing to do. Regurgitation is a rare bug that we are working to drive to zero. And the New York Times is not telling the full story. And it's well worth reading the full article if you want more detail on a case that is pretty important this year. Although, as I've stated, I fully expect it to get settled and the New York Times will get some kind of excellent licensing deal. And I also said before, I think this could be a much better business model than advertising. So, yeah, we will see. Um, But I don't think OpenAI and all this is going to kill brands, uh, big brands. Uh, I think actually it's going to make the importance of branding more important than ever. People are not going to use OpenAI chat GPT to read the New York Times, which is kind of what they're saying um, as one of their issues. But yeah, it's well worth reading this. If you are on the side of the New York Times, please at least read this article to get the other side of the story. In personal news, well, a big shift happened for me this week. I started deadlifting with a mixed grip. So why is that even interesting to you since this is a writing show? (laughs) Well, basically, I was deadlifting and deadlifting is you pick up a weight, a bar with some plates on. You pick it up from the floor uh, with a hook grip usually. So sort of both your hands in sort of hooks like a normal way you would pick up a bar. Um, But my grip was failing at around 70 kilograms, as in the bar became too heavy for my fingers to hold. And so I'd moved into using straps, which go around your wrists and they kind of help you with your grip, but you're still lifting the weight with your back. It's not like cheating in that in, in any other way than it helps your grip, but you're still lifting with your back and your legs and everything like that. So I got up to 90 kgs for deadlift, significantly more than my body weight. And previously, my goal has just been to get stronger and have better functional movement. And I'm definitely achieving that. But as I mentioned in my New Year's goals, um, my goal is to enter uh, powerlifting competitions once I'm 50, which is in next year in 2025. So I have to change tactics because you aren't allowed straps. And so uh, since my grip fails at 70 kgs, I was like, okay, how do we get over this? And my trainer said, well, you need to go mix grip. So that means turning one hand the other way. So turn instead of having both of your hands sort of as if they're fists around a bar, you turn one, so it's uh, underneath. And then you go backwards and forwards, so you're not always doing it with the same way. You can Google mixed grip deadlift if you're really interested. And I've seen, you know, crossfitters do it, like Tia Toomey and Matt Fraser, and uh, I'm totally aware of it, but I was afraid of it. I thought, oh, that's going to disrupt everything I've built so far. It's it's going to, I'm going to go back to the beginning. It's, I'm going to have to relearn. Uh, This is, I don't really want to do this. So I I was worried. And uh, I said to Dan, my trainer, I don't think I can do 70 with this. And he's like, yeah, you can just give it a go. So it was really weird. It's like a weird way to hold a bar. Uh, But as soon as I picked it up, it was amazing. I suddenly felt like, oh, wow, this is crazy. This really works. But the only way to go forward in a new direction and get to the next level was to knock back the weight change the position or change the strategy and then start again. So go backwards, take a step backwards in order to go forwards in a new direction and eventually surpass the old way of doing things. And now I feel quite confident that I'm going to surpass 90 with mixed grip. And that is pretty exciting. (laughs) But I wanted to share it with you. I hope you can see the metaphor. This is not about deadlifting. Um, I had to do the same thing when I left my day job to go full time as an author. I took a big step backwards, a massive pay cut. Oh, goodness. I don't think I've ever sort of calculated how much. Probably an 80% pay cut I took, 80%. 
And we sold our house, we moved, we downsized, we got rid of our debt in order to start again. That was a massive step back. It took years to get back to my the income I was was on. So it took me from 2011 to 2015 to get back to my day job income. And then I have surpassed it every year since. And I'm starting my next 15 years as per the recent 15 year pivot episode. I need to step backwards in order to step forwards in a new direction. So for example, learning more about how to do direct sales, learning about Kickstarter, um, learning how to do physical products, learning how to do better quality physical books, all of this kind of thing. So I feel like I'm going backwards. I'm learning lots of new things. But I know that after a time, I will be able to achieve more. I'm taking this step back so I can step forward in another direction. And I uh, adapt it. And yeah, changing to mix grip did give me a blast of confidence that I could adapt in this in this sort of muscle memory that I've been training now for training with Dan for four years now I started in 2019 so I guess yeah September 2019 is when I started training when I had my shoulder injury my shoulder injury was from writing posture (laughs) you can end up with an injury as a writer for sure Um, but yes I guess the point is if you're starting out or if you're pivoting or if you're trying something new where might you need to accept that you need to take a step back in order to learn new skills a new strategy in order to move forward again because it's not just a relentless step forward and the writing life is not just an, a, a straight line curve from the bottom left to the top right you know in a straight line it doesn't work like that it's a wiggly line and you have to go backwards in order to go forwards that kind of thing so yeah I thought that was an interesting after I did it I was like wow this is so cool and then I realized it actually had quite a lot of uh, implications for us all In terms of writing things, yes, I'm still working on rewriting my author blueprint. It is a massive rewrite uh, because of how much the industry's changed. And I'm also going to get it edited. That will be out mid-February and is only for those on my email list, thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. I've also been prepping my slides for a big talk I'm doing at the History Quill online conference. Now, this, there is a craft day for historical fiction authors and a second day about author business, where most sessions are relevant for all authors. They're not specifically historical fiction. My talk is on Sunday, the 4th of September at 6pm UK, and it's 90 minutes and it's on writing and publishing in an age of AI. It is going to blow some minds for sure. And uh, my process with talks is to do the draft reasonably well in advance, then finesse as I get closer to it. And of course, with AI, I'll have to adapt even up to the day before the talk. So it is super informative and hopefully inspiring. If you fancy coming along virtually, you can do. You can buy a ticket even just for that second day at thecreativepen.com forward slash history 24, thecreativepen.com forward slash history 24. And that is my affiliate link for the tickets. Other things, something technical you might need to sort out. I sorted out my DMARC records this week. So this is all caps, D-M-A-R-C. Now, why should you care? (laughs) Well, if you send emails as an author, so if you have an email list that is with a email hosting service, so I use ConvertKit, for example, you might use, I don't know, MailerLite or whatever you use, Aweber, uh, you have to do this thing. Now, it's a small technical thing that you have to do on your domain. Uh, So your domain host, and it essentially verifies you as a human. Now, this is this is a doubling down on being human, little technical thing. Uh, It is essentially critical because after the 1st of February, emails will start going to spam as you won't be a verified sending domain. And uh, I went to a webinar with ConvertKit, who I am with, and they said the rise in spam and phishing emails is pretty much exponential. Again, in an age of AI, you need to prove that you are human. And what this does is a sort of technical way of proving to Google and uh, there's a couple of a couple of other services that are treating this very seriously, that uh, you're a real, e- a real person emailing. So, um, 
depending on who your email host is, they will have a procedure for doing it. So don't freak out when you actually read the stuff or watch a video. It only took me maybe 10 minutes to do. (laughs) So it's not a big deal to do it. It is a big deal if you don't do it. So that is DMARC, D-M-A-R-C, and uh, just go to your mailing uh, host service and they should have something about it. So I also reassessed my timeline for the year. Now I know we're only, this is the 13th of January. I made my goals towards the end of December and you heard about them on the 1st. So this is two weeks into the year and I'm already reassessing. The reason why is because I knew there were elections this year, but pretty much all the podcasts I listen to, a lot of them are tech shows, um, but you know, or current affairs shows or whatever, pretty much all of them have really become obsessed with the politics that are going on this year, even if they are not a politics show. My two biggest audiences are the US and the UK. We have elections this year. Both are contentious. And even if they don't result in an upset, the whole year will be spent talking about the possibility of what might change. It feels like 2016 all over again when Donald Trump won in the US and the UK had the Brexit vote, which was marginally won by leave. Both of those election um Elections were, were tight and close and disruptive for some people in good ways and up for other people in bad ways. So uh, I'm not going to talk about politics. <laughs> but what I am going to say is the news cycle is going to really dominate this year. It also looks like both of the elections will be in November, possibly within a week of each other. So that means pretty much the whole year is going to be dominated by politics. It is a well-known fact that book sales drop in a US election year. If you haven't heard that before, you can look it up. But it is a well-known fact because people's attention is taken up by a crazy news cycle. So I had planned to do my Kickstarters in April. So my Arcane Spear of Destiny Kickstarter was going to be in April. And then my um, Gothic Cathedral project was going to be November. (laughs) And then I was like, okay, that is a crazy idea. So I'm not going to do November, but I'm not going to do October because I need a longer lead time for my book, um, books or whatever it's going to turn into. I also, I don't like December, so I'm not going to do it in December. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to avoid the whole crazy last quarter of the year. And I'm going to move the Gothic Cathedral project into like this time next year. So mid January to mid February will be the Gothic Cathedral Kickstarter, which also means I can move the Arcane one a bit later. And that's going to give me more time. So on the Arcane book, I'm going, I'm really sort of investigating at the moment what I'm going to do, I will probably do a exclusive edition with a completely different cover. Uh, for the Kickstarter. So it will be hardback. It's going to have hopefully silver foil. It will have a ribbon and it will have colour photos in an extended author's note essay, which will also include my research process for the book. So it's going to be, and that will only be available in the Kickstarter. So it's going to be completely exclusive product, which I hope will be uh, enough to make people want to buy it in the hardback. And then of course, there'll be the early access to the ebook and audiobook and everything, uh, as well as bundles and all of that. So, But I, I want to spend more time on both the book and the quality of the product, as well as obviously the writing and uh, the planning for the campaign. And then for Gothic Cathedrals, I have so much I want to research. I've been, <laughs> I'm in my sort of book buying uh, process for for it. So I'm buying books on beauty and art and awe and um, I'm thinking about an essay on where the veil is thin which I've talked about I talk about very much I write about it in my fiction all the time I wrote about it in pilgrimage which is places where you feel like that there is I get that's why it's so hard I want to write about it because it's so hard to describe but when you feel it you know it Um, and in pilgrimage I talk about feeling it when I walked across the um, the sands to Lindisfarne this kind of moment that I could have been out of time I could have been a thousand years ago I I I was touching something that was was far beyond our world and also when I was in um, Canterbury Cathedral listening to the the choir and they were practicing it wasn't even the main service and I just felt this sort of moment of spiritual openness and not God because I'm I'm not a Christian as such but this idea of the veil being thin is something that I want to write about and yet it's such a big thing 
and difficult to write about. So anyway, Gothic Cathedrals is not just going to be a photo book. It's going to have essays on all these different aspects uh, of um, beauty and awe and yeah, all the stuff. So these are big projects again and I've decided that I need more time like Pilgrimage and Writing the Shadow the Gothic Cathedral book is a book of my heart it is not a book that fits into any particular category and this also I need more time to let the material breathe plan the marketing campaign and with the amount of content produced every day and it is only getting bigger the tsunami of content is growing and growing and growing the answer is not producing more in terms of volume. It's about producing more in terms of quality and value. And that takes time. And the marketing campaign also takes more time to plan and execute. Look, even if you can write a book in a month without AI, what if you can do that? You know, a lot of authors have been doing that just normally for ages. Even if you can write a book in a month, the old way of just the sort of release digitally and move on to the next one, that's going to change, as I've been talking about. But to me, we need indie authors. We've been guilty of just putting the book up on the ebook stores and getting on to the next book. But that is that model is broken with how fast you can write and publish a book with AI. And the quality is no longer in question. If you actually look at some of the work you can just generate, you will see that. I have no problem with it if you want to do that. But the point is, you still have to stand out. It doesn't matter how fast you produce work anymore. How do you reach readers in this market? And for me, the answer is higher quality books, physical products that AI is not going to do um, and investing in a lot longer marketing campaign, which is hilarious because it's actually more like traditional publishing. (laughs) So yes, I know some people won't like that, but this is another question for you this week. How can you produce more in terms of quality and value, both in your words and in your products and marketing in 2024? And a supplementary question, do you need to adjust your timelines to account for the election cycle in the US and the UK. So thanks for your emails and comments this week uh, on my New Year's goals. So simple 3585 said on YouTube, thanks for the inspiration and good luck with the powerlifting. Is it too early to put my name down for your Zen and the art of heavy squatting Kickstarter? (laughs) That made me laugh. (laughs) Oh, you never know. I mean, I'm not going to write off at some point doing something on another physical book I mean the healthy author was how many years ago now the healthy writer sorry was a few years ago now um which I co-wrote with Ewan Lawson maybe I'll have to persuade him to do another edition (laughs) so there were lots of other comments this week but um I realize (laughs) I've been going on a while but you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the youtube channel or email me and particularly send me pictures of where you're listening joanna at thecreativepen.com i love to hear from you it makes this more of a conversation So this episode is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, because however you choose to publish, whether you go direct to readers, you kickstart your book or whatever you do, you go indie and and you want or even if you want a traditional deal, you need to make your book the best it can be. Pro Writing Aid is one of my absolute must use tools in my writing process. I use it for every book, every short story. I open Pro Writing Aid on my computer and I open my Scrivener project within it. This is when I finished my first draft. I work through each chapter, which is more manageable than doing a whole document. And there are lots of different reports that suggest uh, improvements. And I don't accept all the changes, of course, but it helps me find a lot of problems and things I can fix. And of course, it integrates with Word and other writing software as well. Pro Writing Aid knows all the rules of editing and helps you apply them. And of course, you can choose not to make the changes as you like. It helps with making your writing more active, finding repeated words, finding words you could improve and phrases you could rephrase, sentence structure, grammar, punctuation, typo, spacing and more. So why use software to help you? Why don't you just learn all the grammar and writing rules and apply them yourself? Well, we all use tools to improve our process. That is part of what makes us human, using tools. And we are also often blind to our writing issues. It helps to have another pair of eyes, even if the eyes are software. So won't an editor do all this? A human editor, I mean. Well, yes, they can. But I'd rather pay my human editor, and I still use a human editor, Kristen, who's been on the show, to fix the things that the software can't. 
As brilliant as pro-writing aid is, it cannot read the manuscript as a whole and comment on the bigger issues like character development or inconsistencies or plot holes or structure for non-fiction. So I use pro-writing aid as my essential editing tool before sending to my human editor. You can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna. That's prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to the 21 new patrons who've joined this week. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. This week, I put out a video discussion with Tara Kremen from KWL, Cobra Writing Life, on the Patreon channel, demoing KWL's most important features and the promotions tab. Coming up this week, I have a video on how to make a book trailer with Dali and Canva. And that's something else I did this week. I made a trailer for Beneath the Zoo. You can see it on my Instagram at jfpenauthor. Uh, it's also on YouTube. Uh, it's on lots of the socials. It's on my ex at The Creative Pen. Uh, it's on lots of places. It's also on my Shopify store, jfpenbooks.com. And uh, it's on the Beneath the Zoo pages. Uh, so yes, I made the book trailer on last Sunday uh, with Dali and then with Canva. So I go through the entire end-to-end process. So if you join the community, you get that and all the backlist videos and audio access to the monthly Q&A where you can ask your questions, which is an extra solo episode a month and videos of behind the scenes with AI tools and much more. It is a monthly subscription, the equivalent of a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. So if you feel you get value from the show and you want more, come on over and join more than 950 authors. Join us at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. And if you're worried about how to access the content, you can get it through the app, which has easy access to view and listen. Right, let's get into the interview. Barbara Nicholas is the multi-award winning and international best-selling author of the Sydney Rose Parnell crime thrillers and the Dr. Evan Wilding serial killer thrillers. So welcome to the show, Barbara. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited to talk to you. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. You know, I have wanted to be a writer for as long as I can remember. And I think what it gelled for me when I was three years old. <laughs> I had eye surgery when I was three. And when I was in the hospital, we weren't allowed visitors. And I just, I I took these get well cards I got from my mom and I started making up stories to write on the back. And I just imitated her handwriting because I didn't know how to write. And then when she could visit me, I would tell the stories as if I were actually reading my writing So even at that point, I think writing was a healing process for me, and I could escape into the stories. And my first story, (laughs) my first story, I had grand ambitions, Joanna. I intended to write a story about about slavery and and coming to, to deal with that. And it was a historical novel. And I started out with my my heroine on a horse. She was going to go to the auction and try to rescue some people. And I realized I had no idea what I was doing. So she fell off the horse on the second page and and died. And I had to change the title from Road to Freedom to Trampled by a Horse. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. I love how wait, how old were you when you decided to tackle slavery as a topic? (laughs) I think I was about eight. I love that. And actually, before we move on there, this is such a common issue. And I've definitely been there too, which is, I care so much about this topic. I want to write this really important book that yes. helps people with this topic. Uh, and yes. yeah, I mean, I think maybe have you yet to do a, your massive book on dealing with slavery? <laughs> I have learned to not overreach. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a few books. Yeah. On the back burner, I hope to get to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so jumping forward from eight, how did you get into professional writing? It was a long and varied path. I wrote off and on. And then when I got my undergraduate degree in English literature, I wrote a fantasy novel as my independent project. And then I went into high tech and spent years working as a technical writer and oh my gosh, I did so many things. I was a piano teacher, I was a cave rescuer, I 
I did this, that, and the other thing and kind of ignored that voice that was telling me, right? And then in 2012, we lost our house and pretty much everything we owned in a wildfire, Mm -hmm. the Waldo Canyon wildfire. And at that point, I said, either do this, Barbara, or go work for Amnesty International. I mean, do something. (laughs) And that's what launched the Sydney Parnell series and, and turned me into a professional writer, much to my amazement. Mm. But then from there, so you started writing seriously then. So how did your publishing career progress? I was so lucky. So I agreed with my husband, I would go to Thriller Fest, which is the International Thriller Writers Conference in New York, happens annually. And they have something called Pitch Fest, which is like a one of those dating routines where you sit down with somebody for three minutes, see if you have anything in common and move on. And mm-hmm. so with Pitch Fest, you're pitching your novel to agents and editors. And and my husband and I agreed I would this would be my last, almost my first and and also my last attempt at, at becoming a published author. And it went wonderfully. And I found my agent. I literally made an elevator pitch. So it wasn't in Pitch Fest um, that I found my first agent. And the book, there were multiple bids for it, and we chose Thomas and Mercer. And so are you still with Thomas and Mercer for everything? Or I'm interested because you obviously, we've connected now, but I know you you know of the indie world. And so oh, yes. how, how are you spanning both at the moment? I'm not in the indie world. I'm still with Thomas and Mercer. My skill set is not in everything that has to be done in indie publishing. And I so admire you for the work that you do. And so many of my author friends who have chosen to indie pub for a variety of reasons, I have great admiration, but it is not my skill set. Maybe I'll go that way just to keep writing the kinds of books that I want to write. I would love to do a hybrid career, but at this point, It's all I can do to get a book out a year for Thomas and Mercer. (laughs) No, fair enough. So I just want to circle back on something you said before, which is you ignored the voice that said you wanted to be a writer and you did all these Mm -hmm. kind of other jobs and you got into technical writing and all of that, which I definitely had as well. But Mm -hmm. obviously that wildfire was the moment where you were like, I've got to take a chance on something. But for people who might be ignoring that voice, it is a huge risk. And I mean, you've got to this crossroads, I guess, where you'd already lost so much. So it was less of a risk. But we hope that everyone doesn't have to have a wildfire in order to yes. make a jump. So I mean, can you speak to this sort of courage needed to step into a new life and some of the, that wavering moment? Because it's that beginning, isn't it? That's so hard. You're absolutely right. And it's a bit like the hero's journey, where sometimes we can choose to cross that threshold and take a new path. Other times we get drop kicked into our new world and we have to figure it out. And that's what the fire did for me. But I think without that, I ultimately would have learned to listen to that voice. It was fear that kept me away from it. And also it's very hard in our world to announce I'm a writer. You need to respect my time. I This is a thing I'm doing. And so at that point, <laughs> nobody was really paying attention to what I was doing. I was rebuilding almost literally our lives after the wildfire. And I could sneak in that time to write. And it did not come easily at first because I still carried that fear. And then exactly as you said, it's like, oh my gosh, I've lost so much. I've survived. I'm still sitting here. I can do this. And if if I fail, I'd love to find out now and move on. And I hope that people can dig deep into themselves and find that inner voice and let that voice speak without worrying about what comes of it. What does it what does it matter if you don't publish? I mean, it's a lovely dream that most writers have. But the important thing is the story, because that's the only thing that we can control. We mm. can't control how the world reacts to what we produce. But the act of producing itself is a balm to the soul. Yeah, I mean, that's what we have to keep coming back to. And that's why I'm still doing this as well. It's that all the other stuff is is making a living and you can make a living in other ways, you know, yeah. but the act of creation that, you know, I have my wall here, measure your life by what you create. And that mm. to me is the point. It's like, what, what if I created 
this month, this year, that I feel like I've made some kind of, I don't know, the work, as you say, the work is important to me, but also the work can touch other people. And like we were talking before we hit record, that both of us were kind of aware of each other and had read each other's work without actually knowing each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we connected, which is amazing. But I did want to ask you on this because you mentioned earlier that you could have taken a, like, you could have gone down the route of like Amnesty International. And you talked before about caring about s- slavery. And so you've obviously got this sort of social justice side of you. And one of the things that comes up a lot for fiction writers is should I be doing something better, in inverted commas, with my time than writing? fiction and this came up for a lot of us in the pandemic it was like oh my goodness should I just go and train as a doctor or nurse or caring or something so how do you deal with that feeling of you know is this enough for the world oh I absolutely love this question and I grapple with it every day is is what I'm doing useful in any way and no matter what you're writing you're offering something to someone whether it's an escape, whether it's a new way to look at things, whether it's an understanding of somebody and their life that you didn't understand before, it all adds to this great human collective, I guess the Jungian collective unconscious that allows us to support each other. And I was rewarded with my Sydney Parnell series by hearing from veterans and from families of veterans saying, thank you. This is exactly what it's like to come home from war and to be around people who don't understand what I have been through or to support my husband or my son or my brother in in his or her struggle to deal with this. And so even a book written primarily for entertainment can offer more. That said, I'm, I I do want to do a historical novel that grapples with the situation in Israel and Palestine, which has just exploded, obviously, recently. I managed to get in and out last May into Israel and the West Bank when things were relatively calm and gained new insights. And now that book feels extremely important. But it's like that book on slavery. Am I the person to tell this story? Do I have the skill set to tell this story? So I grapple with that, too. Hmm. And actually, this is a difficulty that a lot of people talk about. And I don't know, it's very hard. There's one opinion that says you should not write anything that is not based on your lived experience. And then there's the other side, which says you are a fiction writer, you do research, and you try your best. And that fiction is about empathy and all this. And our books would be very boring if they were just about the people we are. (laughs) So what what are your feelings on this, considering some of the massive topics you might choose? Yes, yes. I mean, I'm grappling with that too, as I'm sure you are. I, I firmly believe that we should be allowed to tell the stories that we want to tell. I also don't want to bump other voices. So it's been lovely to see this push toward diversity and towards mainstreaming voices that were sidelined. I just hope that there's room for all of us. And I hope that there's understanding and compassion for and forgiveness in all of us attempting to write stories that are not our lived experience. And I think this struggle is going to go on for a time, and then it will settle. And hopefully it will settle with a broader and more diverse audience than we have now. But Mm -hmm. again, I hope we can we can all tell the stories that matter to us that speak to our heart. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I mean, again, I wouldn't want to do this if I was only writing stories about middle-aged, middle-class white women <laughs> living in Bath. <laughs> it's been quite I boring. Yes. <laughs> but I guess on that, uh, even though we write primarily, both of us write fiction, research is a, is a huge part of the process. So tell us a bit about your research process. I love research. And if somebody had told me when I was a kid that, oh, you can grow up to be an historian and a researcher, or you can be somebody's research assistant, I'm not sure I would have turned into a fiction novelist. <laughs> it's, um, writing writing is almost an excuse for me to explore the things that interest me. Me and too. If, yes, I know. <laughs> and it shines so beautifully in your work. 
And I know you travel for your stories, as do I. And that's one of the greatest pleasures. It's almost as if I'm giving myself permission to go on vacation and a tax write-off. So that's that's wonderful. One of the things that happened with the new series with the Dr. Evan Wilding books, and I'm going to be just very frank here because like we, we've talked about the shadow writing. And as I was starting at First Light, which is the first book in that series, I lost my son to epilepsy, something called SUDEP, Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy. And one day he was here and the next day he was gone. And again, it was writing through healing. And what I got to do in that book was do a deep dive into the things I had loved so much in college, which was old English literature, the Viking age people. And that that helped me cope with the trauma of losing him. And so that's, again, the beauty of writing is, is hopefully it touches our audience, but it also helps us as well. And I had been to England. I've been to Bath. In fact, I somebody... <laughs> I hitchhiked my way to Bath. It was it was wonderful. And so I didn't feel the need to go back for that. And it was during the pandemic. So it wasn't wasn't possible. But some of my other books have taken me in other places. And the people you meet are the highlight. Mm. I, and obviously, I'm so sorry about your son. And it's awful that that happened to you. And I'm so glad you found solace in writing. And I feel like this is another part of being a writer is that we can put our pain onto the page. Um, But I wonder if maybe you could comment on the difference between writing for therapy and writing for an audience for publication, because I I do feel there is a bit of a line there. Yeah, that's a great topic. And so I teach creative writing to veterans. It's part of a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Defense and the National Endowment for the Arts, because they have learned how much writing is a healing process. And it's interesting how the difference between journaling and creating fiction for um, for potential publication. And my students do both. What I have found personally is... I can pour my heartache into my characters and process it through them, even when I'm writing professionally. And I think that's what touches readers. The emotion is genuine and they feel it. And we've all gone through our traumas and our losses and our griefs. And and so seeing how a character copes with that can be helpful. So it's a combination of both, I think. Yeah, except I think I don't, seem to remember there was, you know, Dr. Evan Wilding doesn't lose a son to epilepsy, for example. (laughs) It's not like a direct connection between the character experiencing what you experience, which I think sometimes people think fictionalizing it is the best way, but you've almost just put it in there in different forms, I guess. Yeah, I think it's almost an archetypal thing. And in different forms, you're exactly right. So Evan Wilding is four feet, five inches. And he has to walk through the world that way. He cannot pretend to be anything other than what he is on the outside. And that's that's its own form of learning to adjust to the world when the world won't adjust to us. And so I could sort of displace my traumas and look at him. And he's actually way mentally healthier than I am. <laughs> he doesn't have too many issues but it still allowed me to to push through that and then to deal with what or to, to create what made my killer who he is. Um, the traumas that that our villains go through. Mm. Yeah, and I love the books, uh, the Dr. Evan Wildings particularly. Uh, really, I just love them. I think they're fantastic. Oh, um, thank, you. thank you. Oh, no, they're so good. Um, for those people who like the sort of brainy thrillers, I would say, this, your research <laughs> process is, is awesome. I love it. But tell us more about Dr. Evan Wilding, because the research stuff is really interesting, but he is a great character. So tell us a bit more. I mean, you said, obviously, he's short, very short. But tell us more about him. And also, what are your tips for writing original characters? Characters. Sure. So he's um, he is a semiotician, which people have are, are rarely familiar with that term. So a semiotician is somebody who studies signs and symbols across cultures, 
And he's a forensic semiotician, particularly, so he focuses on those aspects that sometimes show up at crime scenes. And that's a lot of fun. That was that was a love of mine. I love symbolism, and as I know you do. Mm-hmm. And he was actually a character I created some 20 years ago and finally found a place for him. And he came sort of like Athena from Zeus's hat. He just, he was just there. But some of my other characters, it's more work, but in a good way. So it's a combination of observation and research. For example, with Sydney Parnell in my first series, she's a former Marine and she served in mortuary affairs. And so she has a very unique perspective on the war. And she came home haunted in a way. And so that was the research part. And then just letting letting the elements of those characters kind of just um, compost, let them stir around until a character starts to form. And sometimes there'll be a lightning bolt. I'm sure you have felt this where suddenly mm-hmm. there's the character after after all that time. And imbuing them with interests that you share lets you revel in that. So Sydney drinks a lot of whiskey. I won't say <laughs> I drink a lot, but I enjoy a good single malt. And of course, Evan with his falconry and other aspects of his job, it just let me indulge my own interests. So I would advise writers to to let that go. Enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned the falconry there. You've got <laughs> some secondary characters, including his axe throwing sidekick, research assistant lady, who's sort of yeah, a, Diana, a yes. <laughs> who's amazing, and his brother, who is more like a sort of Indiana Jones character, who we'll come back to. But it's almost like when uh, it's almost like you've given yourself permission to include some quite extreme hobbies and things that are just a not a usual group of things and sometimes people are like oh this just isn't lifelike enough for Mm, a crime novel or a thriller but that's actually what makes them interesting so did you think about that at all or did you like I really like axe throwing I'm just going to put it in (laughs) yeah I didn't give it too much thought (laughs) just it was not a plot development it's like this is so fun. And it just seemed like something Diana would do. And so yeah, just throwing all of those things in for fun. And they're real things. There are lots of axe throwers. There are, I used to be in a group called the Society for Creative Anachronism. And that's where I learned to sword fight. These people are walking among us. (laughs) It's not as far fetched as some people might think. I I, I don't know. I mean, academia is an interesting place. (laughs) Yes, yes, very (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> For sure. I am, Just coming back to Dr. Evan Wilding as well. I mean, when I'm reading it, I am seeing Peter Dinklage as oh, yes. <laughs> Evan Wilding. For people who don't know, he's Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones. And I think he would be marvellous. I, I mean, have you had any interest? Because I think he would be amazing. <laughs> I've heard that from so many people. And oh my gosh, wouldn't that just be You fantastic. should send it to him. Have you sent it to him? Oh, I don't think he'd pay any attention to something from me. (laughs) You should totally do it, though, because he's a brainy guy. And uh, it would be it would be awesome. But yeah, it was funny because often we do have actors in mind. I guess I do in my mind when I write for characters. So I think that's really interesting. So uh, also tell us about I mean, I guess you've said a bit there about throwing things in that you're interested in. But how do you make sure that the whole cast of characters gives you enough across a series? Oh, that's a great question. And I wish I had a brilliant answer. I'm not sure I think that far ahead. I create characters that I want to spend time with, or the kinds of characters who give me nightmares who also intrigued me and I want to spend time with. I've never been good about planning characters across series. So it's a very organic process for me. But I hope that if I find these characters, and especially the secondary characters, interesting, that the reader will as well, and and that they'll see themselves in one or another character. Um, River Wilding, Evan's brother, was one of the toughest because, like you said, he's a sort of Indiana Jones character, and I didn't want to do an Indiana Jones knockoff. Um, and so I I struggled with that because, of course, I love Indiana Jones. Yeah, I was going to say, why not? Indiana Jones, yes. 
But I wanted River to be his own man. And my editors expressed interest in doing a spinoff series with River and Diana, which would just be a hoot. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. (laughs) You should should do that. (laughs) I I very well may. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's interesting. But just coming back to, I guess you said you're organic there. So what is your writing process in terms of, are you coming up with plot first or starting with the characters or what's your process? I'm still trying to figure that out. So the fact that my publisher wants a book every nine to 12 months, and I am glacially slow, not because I want to be, I just am. I have so many stories. I wish I were a faster writer. That is something I'm trying to work on. And and in that process, I'm starting to to plot more in advance. I've learned that not only do I need to know what my hero is up to, I need to know what my bad guy's up to so that there's an appropriate action and reaction going on. I'll never be able to do the Jeffrey Deaver process, which is to spend the bulk, he spends the bulk of his time thinking through the entire plot. He's like a chess master. He's thought the entire game through and planned his twists. And so that when he sits down to write, the process is really quick. And I will never be able to do that. I get frustrated with the process of plotting. I just want to start getting words on page. And and I never know where the story is going to go until I'm actually in that process. I think it was Joan Didion who said, I write to to know what I'm thinking. And that's mm. that's that story process for me. It is not efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so no, if well, you have I some think, tips, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, I'm also a discovery writer and so I'm pretty similar to you. Oh, I think good. I mean yeah, I mean maybe that's why I like your books as well because <laughs> it's that I I generally start with a place and then there'll be some kind of story kernel, I guess, and then from mm-hmm. there. But to me it's like wrangling chaos. <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, Jeffrey Deaver is like known for writing a 200 page outline and then literally just goes back and makes 200 pages into like 500 pages. Or yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I admire him for that. Like I said, I could not do it. And I, I could write a 200 page outline and on page two, I would have headed off in a different direction, which is not helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, we just wouldn't want to. I don't know if I'd want to do an outline like that because I don't know what, I guess once I know what's going to happen, I don't think I would write the book. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It it is a discovery process, as you said. And once I know what's happened, what's the point? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's interesting. Okay, so you also mentioned there that you are glacially slow as a writer. Yes, yes. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you might only write a couple of hundred words a day? Or do you think about things for ages and then just kind of binge write towards the end of the deadline? Or how do you actually get words on the page? Yeah, so I'm binge writing because I have a deadline at the end of this month. (laughs) So I'll start out with research, just to sort of figure out what the bones of the story might be. And then I force myself to not give too much time over to that. But I really couldn't tell you in terms of weeks or months how long that process lasts. And it goes on throughout the book. And I will move in and out of, oh, I'm going to do a 1000 words today. That doesn't work for me, because I'll use a lot of adverbs and adjectives <laughs> just to pump up my workout. Yay, I'm done. It's 10 a.m. and I'm done for the day. And so it's more of a, a time thing. Okay, I'm going to write for two hours or three hours. And then and that's what I do in the morning. And then I go back in the afternoon to edit. I do get derailed and I do spend a lot of time going back over stuff. And that's probably where I lose more time than I should. I'm very linear when I'm writing, it's hard for me to jump around. And so that's a process I'm working on. I've lately come to think of writing a novel as as being a maestra, being in front of an orchestra and bringing in the horns or bringing in the strings or, or turning to the soloist. And it, it's a more organic and jumping around process than I've let myself enjoy before. So it'll be interesting to see how this current book comes out. As I've, uh, as I've done okay. that process. Mm, well, this is interesting because this is where we differ in that I uh-huh. write, yeah, I write out of order. 
So oh, I do. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I write, I never write in a linear fashion. And then I kind of at the end, because I use Scrivener. I don't know if you use Scrivener. No, I've been wanting to. So you like it? Oh, I love it. And the main reason is because you can just drag and drop. So I write in scenes. So I'll write a scene, you know, Diana and River are doing axe throwing in the garden. I remember that from the latest book. You know, so I'll, I'll write that scene and then that will be in the Scrivener folder. And then I'll write another scene, the murderer guy having a fight or whatever. And then I'll be like, but I don't know how they all hang together until quite late in the process. And then I'll just kind of move them around and then it will, and then I'll have to print it all out and read it and then figure out where it goes from there. But no, Scrivener is amazing because you can just drag and drop scenes and then just recompile into a finished manuscript. Oh my gosh, I love that. Because yeah. I tend to see stories like movie trailers. Mm. So I would picture the scene with River and Diana and their axe throwing competition or the fight by the river which was tough to write, River by the River. Yeah. <laughs> Character River by the Chicago River, that was tough. But I'd never thought of actually writing that way, even though that's how it unfurls in my mind. So you've inspired me. I'm going to give this a try. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank good. You. Well, I will say, I'll send you my little video tutorial on how to use Grivener and I'll oh, put lovely. it in the show notes for anyone Thank else. Thank you. Because oh, it made a real, yeah, it made a real difference for me because I was like, I just don't want to write that. I don't know what happens next. So I'm going to write some big scene that I just want to write this fight scene or I know something's <laughs> going to happen there. So I'm going to write that and I'll figure out what happens later. Like, uh-huh. yes. <laughs> How do I get there from here? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, I'm glad. It, may, it might work for you. You never know. So that that's very cool. But earlier you said that like your editor was interested in a spin-off, but also that you have looked all these stories that you want to write so I wondered like how do you decide on what to write next how do you balance your creative muse with the practical side of having an editor at a publisher and an agent to keep happy yes that that is a balancing act for sure the way the process works for me is I will submit several ideas and my agent she, she said you're very prolific I said what do you mean I can hardly crank out a book in a year and she said no you're idea prolific mm. <laughs> and w- this last time we whittled my already whittled list of 10 ideas down to I think eight submitted those to my editor who said wow this is an embarrassment of riches which one of these do you want to write so that was a lot of fun but I would love to continue my series and I don't see that happening unless I indie pop. So that's again where the the publishing side of it and all the aspects of that can run up against what I want to do. People are astonished when I say, well, my publisher doesn't want any more Evan Wilding books. Um, they said, well, can't you write what you want to write? Well, no, it's a business and there's a lot that goes into the making those decisions. So yeah, it's a balancing act. And maybe I can get that hybrid career going at some point. Mm. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I'd i like some more of those and Evan as a character. But it is interesting, especially when you're with a, a publishing house that has a particular niche and a particular vibe going on. And then if you're writing something that I think the Evan Wilding books are a longer a longer burn, you know, that yes. you're going to acquire readers over time. And those readers really love the character and the series and want more of them. But it's not like, oh, out the gate, 100 million people buy the books. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but if I certainly only. want more. <laughs> <laughs> if only. And yes, and it's interesting to see whatever kind of audience that, that a book picks up. And and with the Evan books, it's been wonderful to hear from college English professors or human rights activists or attorneys. It's interesting. And I hope that you're right, that it's a slow burn. I think the books are selling well by what would be many publisher standards. My publisher has a pretty high bar. Mm. So we'll, we'll just see how things go. Yeah, I- indeed. Well, I mean, it's interesting, though, because you've now got the two two series so I uh, do you think you want to carry both of them on or are you going to be starting another one or because I mean I know the more series you have the more difficult it is to kind of 
I don't know, satisfy <laughs> the readers of all of them. <laughs> Yeah. So my goodness, how do you do that? And and you do it so well. And I'm actually writing my first standalone now. Oh, um, okay. And I'm breaking into espionage, which is something I've wanted to do for quite some time. So that will be interesting too. Will my readers stay with me for this kind of book? And I hope they they come for their faith in my ability to create good characters and then stay for the story. But mm. we'll see. Yeah, well, that brings up an interesting point then about book marketing, because even traditionally published authors have to do some book marketing. So what do you, yeah, what do you focus on for book marketing? And this is really embarrassing for me. I, I don't. (laughs) My publisher is very good at marketing and I know that I need to do more and I, and I want to do more. I want to figure this out, but it seems to be all I could do, like I said, to get the book out, that glacially slow thing. And so to add marketing, I think it was it you that who said that you devote a day of the week to that? No, no. I no? tend to okay. do creative stuff in the morning and then in the afternoon I'll do business stuff and marketing stuff. Oh, that makes that makes sense. That's really good. And someone who's very successful writes Monday through Thursday and then devotes Friday to to marketing. And I keep thinking I'm going to get to that point, but I haven't yet. Well, you at least have you have a website, right? You have an email I do. list. I do. I do. I need to create a reader magnet. Is that the right term? Something to <laughs> entice people to sign up for my newsletter. Well, yeah, short, you know, short story, long. short stories are good. Mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, you know, that's yeah. or or just having the option. I'm pretty sure I'm on your email list. Is it just a sign up right now? It's just a passive sign up. Yeah. So mm. oh, thank you for being on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, one of these days I'll get a newsletter out. <laughs> yeah, well, there there is that. But even just the passive idea I think is important and I guess we should also point out and this is kind of why it's interesting to talk to you we should point out you know I'm a fan of your books and yet you said you don't do any marketing now obviously Thomas and Mercer is Amazon so they have a lot of marketing built in but you can do all the marketing in the world and then your books don't resonate with people they publish a hell of a lot of other books per year like they publish a lot of books and they're um, acquiring so many new authors yes yeah i mean they yeah. are pumping them out they must be putting out several hundred just under thomas and mercer alone absolutely mm-hmm. yeah so as readers we find the authors that we enjoy right somehow we find them even without hardcore marketing Yes. I don't I don't even remember something about your books flashed in front of me and I went, Oh, that's what I want to read, but I don't even remember how it happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, sometimes and I was reflecting on this the other week on, on the beginning of this podcast and I was kind of saying, Look, there's um oh it was a, a day of the lo- year of the locust. Have you seen that Terry Hayes latest no. book? No. Oh, you might like that as an espionage oh thing um but his his last book came out over a decade ago and this is only his second book and he doesn't have an email list he's not done anything his pre-order had been cancelled like four times and yet the day it comes out I'm like reading it (laughs) oh my gosh wow yeah I will check this out but how does he do that wow (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, and it's a lot to do with this. The original book was so very good um, yeah. that it was like, okay, well, I really want to read this again. And the second book was also good. But it is it is interesting. I think we obsess about the need for marketing. And yet, as we came back to at the beginning, the most important thing is to write the books that we want to write. And something about that will connect with someone else at some point. <laughs> Yes, yes, I I really do believe that. And that that juggling balance of how much do we want to produce? And what can we reasonably do in a reasonable time? I mean, I, I look at you, and I'm just astonished at your level of productivity, and yet producing high quality work. Um, I'm afraid if I tried your process, if I tried to be as productive as you are, I would not produce high quality work. Do you have thoughts on that? 
<laughs> well, I think is it um, discipline? Is it drive? What? What? Are, I think it's also that I write shorter books than you. <laughs> well, I should try that too. I don't mean to write long books. They just swell. They're like those little sponges when you drop them in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and they just well, grow exactly so probably for your three evan wildings that's probably six of my arcane books um yeah, yeah. so i yeah. think there, there are different things but again it's looking at our body of work and saying are we happy with our body of work so i guess moving into espionage is really interesting but what else do you see i guess for the years ahead you've mentioned maybe there might be some part of you that wants to be hybrids but have you got any other things sort of burning away i have i i will definitely die before i get all the ideas written that i want to write that historical fiction that I mentioned involving Israel and Palestine, other historical novels, other ideas for series. It's frustrating for me that I don't write faster so that I can get to those. I hope that the espionage um, thing, when we throw that at the wall, that it sticks because I find that world absolutely fascinating and especially the world we live in now and, and all the things that are happening beneath the surface or or happening on the other side of the world that are affecting people in America and Europe, I I think it's important for people to understand those things. So we'll see where that goes. So I guess bottom line, my answer is we'll see what happens with this book. Meanwhile, I'm going to jump into the historical novel and mm. um, and also the River and Diana. So so many things are calling. <laughs> yeah, maybe Scribner will help. <laughs> yeah, maybe it will. You never know. So where can people find you and your books online? The easiest place to find my books is on Amazon. Um, you can look up Barbara Nicholas. And if you want to follow me, then that would be great. You'll get notifications of my upcoming books. My website is www.barbaranicholas.com. Come and poke around. That would be great. Well, thanks so much for your time, Barbara. That was great. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. So I hope you found this interview interesting and that Barbara's story inspired you to focus on the books only you can write, those books that mean so much to you. If you want the Scrivener tutorial I mentioned, it's linked at the top of my tools page, thecreativepen.com forward slash tools. Now, I'd also love to know what you think about the various questions we posed during this episode, the ones I asked in the intro or um, anything that Barbara had to say. You can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. You can leave a message on the show notes or a comment at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel. So next week, I have an interview on merchandising as part of direct sales for authors with thriller author Alex Carver. And we go into the different physical products that she sells and how she focuses on launching one book a year and much more. So in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>